So let me bring up our first innovator of the year finalist, Ben Wynn, lead customer success at Seamless MD. Welcome to the stage. Awesome. Thanks so much, Burke. Um, this has been an amazing conference so far. I'm from Toronto, Canada. Uh, there's a lot I didn't know about Utah coming down. Uh, I didn't know that you had beautiful vistas, like I saw mountain biking. Didn't know you had skiing. I thought it was like a desert. Um, I didn't know where it was. Someone asked me where Utah was a couple weeks ago, and I went somewhere in the middle, I think. Um, so I looked at a map, and now I know. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm a huge Simpsons fanatic. I have tried to not have a ton of Simpsons references in my presentation. Um, I'm a CS speaker and writer. I originated and built the CS team at Seamless MD. Currently manage strategic projects there with C-Suite. I also co-founded the Venture Out Conference, which is Canada's first LGBTQ inclusion in tech and entrepreneurship conference. Uh, we're in our third year now. I'm an advisor for Ask AI. Uh, I have a new ebook coming out next week on um, the beginner's guide to customer success for early stage startups. Uh, and if anyone's going to be in Toronto next week, we're having a huge CS event uh, next Thursday, so hit me up and we'd love to have you there. A little bit about uh, Seamless. There we go. Uh, we're enterprise healthcare. We work with organizations in Canada and the United States um, to do things like pre-op optimization, collect patient-reported outcomes, reduce readmissions, reduce length of, reduce length of stay, a uh, whole bunch of things, and we do that for cardiac surgery, bariatrics, urology, um, a lot of great things like that. So health tech and uh, data in particular is really important in that space, which will come into play in my presentation. So my innovation, we'll get right into it. Why do we measure customer health scores? Can anyone yell out, why do we measure them? Prioritization, predictive, transparency, efficiency, risk assessment, definitely all great things. Um, and I thought a lot, like, I've thought long and hard about all this, and I think if you take a step back, at the core of all of it, we measure health scores to understand and predict account behavior. That's at the core of everything we do on the customer health side. As uh, Kristen put it fantastic the other day, we don't care if an account is 45 yellow, we care what 45 yellow signifies, which is that they might be at risk of churning or however you've configured your score. When I first joined Seamless MD, this was the, uh, the health scoring system. I was employee number 10. This was a very rudimentary version, and I really had no idea what to do with it. Uh, it was a range of slightly less green to very green. So <laughs> it's like, this is great for investors, but I really don't know what to do. Um, so I started looking at what other companies were doing. Uh, I looked at Gainsight. This is on their site. This is a list of about 30 to 40 uh, variables, and they have lists that go on and on, um, growth of the account, renewals completed, survey results, NPS, community involvement, all this kind of stuff. Uh, I looked at Tatango, and they had a bunch of things like license utilization, and logins per month, and usage frequency, and all these sorts of things. Um, and while some of those sounded good to me on the surface, um, I started thinking, well, what if they use it weekly because their boss is telling them they have to? What if their logins are tracked and they know that, so they just log in a bunch of times per day and don't do anything of value? Uh, what if their business is going through a slump? Uh, a lot of times in previous roles, I'd reach out to a customer uh, because I thought their health was poor, and they would say, no, 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 we just have had really low business this month. Your product is actually the one thing that's keeping business coming in. So they're actually extremely healthy. Um, what if they're spending a lot of time on your system but not getting real value? Um, what if users love it but the funder doesn't? That's a huge thing for us. Surgeons love our product because it's innovative and it's fun and they get tons of data they never got before. Patient outcomes are great, all this kind of stuff. But if the CFO or the CIO uh, doesn't see the value, doesn't like it, doesn't know what value they're getting, then we you know, are already in, uh, at a low health score. We're already at risk of churn. So what is the account behavior formula? Uh, my solution was to create a formula that would uh, reduce these complex weighted health scores to two simple factors instead of 10 to 50 to 100. Um, and it's, uh, it's called the account behavior formula, or the ABF. And it predicts whether a given account will renew and or grow their contract, go to a competitor, inform you that they're thinking of churning but give you a chance to save them, or churn without notice. And it's calculating, calculated using two simple factors, a quality of relationship, or QOR score, and a return on investment, ROI. And best of all, no software is required, unless I win this and turn it into a SaaS product that I can sell to all of you. <laughs> uh, 
so before using the ABF at Seamless MD, uh, when I first joined, there was 0% ARR growth from existing customers. It was all new customers coming in. 2.2% uh, churn rate, not terrible, but for a small company starting out, every bit matters. Uh, and the NPS was 61, which is a good NPS, um, but it's not the top tier. Uh, the past 12 months after we implemented this, uh, after I implemented this, it, uh, we saw 150% ARR growth from existing customers, 0% uh, churn, we renewed 100% of the contracts that came up in the past year, and our NPS went up to 71, which isn't that excellent or top tier. So the question on all your minds, how does it work? It's based actually on Jack Schaefer's friendship formula. This is a book where he talks about how he would become friends with terrorists to convert them, or not necessarily terrorists, sorry, terrorists or um, political opponents or people in other countries to become informants for the CIA. Uh, it's a great book, and he talks about the friendship formula being proximity plus duration plus frequency plus intensity. I'll explain more of those in a moment, but my hypothesis was this could be applied instead of in that setting to a business setting um, and specifically with customers. By using these four factors, I could better understand uh, the quality of relationship with my customers. So I started doing some work to validate it. I'll go into that in a moment, but uh, quick definitions. Proximity is the physical distance between yourself and another person. You sit right next to someone. Uh, if you've sat next to the same person both days of this conference, you're probably better friends with them than the person who sat across the room from you. Frequency is the number of interactions with another person. So if you go to the same store every day, uh, you'll have a better relationship with the checkout clerk there than at Target where you go once a month. Uh, duration, this is the length of time that you spend with a person. Uh, so if you sit next to someone at work for eight hours a day versus three hours a day, uh, you're going to have a stronger relationship with them. And intensity, how well you're verbally and non-verbally connecting physically and psychologically with another person and the emo emotional depth of your interactions. So the QOR score, uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's a five-point Likert scale, uh, so very low to very high, and you do it for each of those factors. What's your proximity? What's your frequency? What's your duration? What's your intensity? You add them all up, and your score is out of 20. ROI, a little more nebulous, because uh, it depends on the business model and the available data, uh, but essentially how much value has the client realized, assign it a value, and get the according score. Always important to remember, the ROI that you think the customer has does not matter at all. What matters is the customer, what the, the ROI that the customer believes that they have, in particular the funder or the key stakeholders. So these are the four potential outcomes. There's a big red angry square there. There's a lot of room for a churn, as we've all, we all know. But essentially, if you have a poor quality of relationship and a low ROI, they're going to churn and they're not going to tell you because they don't like you and they're not getting value out of your product. Plain and simple. Um, if you have a great relationship, but they're not getting the ROI, they'll give you a chance to save them. They'll say, hey, Ben, look, we're not getting the value that we want. Can you give us some more guidance? Give us some best practices. Are we doing something wrong? You know, can you help guide us? They'll give you a chance to save them. Um, if you have a high ROI and a low QOR, that means they'll go to a competitor. It means they don't like you, but they love your product. So they'll find someone else who's doing it that they do like, and they'll go to them. Uh, and finally, uh, obviously, if you have a high QOR, High ROI, they're going to renew, they're going to grow, and you can leverage them uh, for future growth. And the nice thing about these four outcomes, so the only outcomes that you really need at the end of the day with complex health scores that you're trying to get to is, you know, which of these is my customer going to do? Uh, and it tells you what you need to know in order to make those kind of decisions using two uh, variables. So at Seamless, I was able to use this hard data to accurately predict the behavior of your customers. Uh, and I could simplify health score generation uh, and demonstrate the amount of ARR that was at risk, the amount of ARR that we were leaving on the table, the upsell opportunities, uh, the number of passives and detractors that could be turned into promoters, uh, and where investment would yield the highest ROI. That was one of the biggest ones. So we then invested and boosted our lowing, lower scoring accounts based on that model. We invested in on-site visits to increase proximity. Uh, we increased touch point frequency. We spent more time working with our customers, increased the duration. Uh, we set hard goals and deadlines. We upped the intensity in the relationship. And uh, we invested in capitalizing on top scoring accounts for referral generation, introductions, uh, quotes and testimonials, all that wonderful stuff. So for those of you who have low touch um, accounts where it's one CSM to 400 accounts or one CSM to 1,000, obviously, you're not going to have that kind of uh, same luxury where you can have a relationship with one key stakeholder and make all the uh, decisions based on that. 
So what you have to do is evaluate the relationship between the customer and your product. For high touch, it's pretty straightforward, but for low touch, you know, you're not calling Uber head office every time that you're taking a ride, uh, but you're opening your app and you're having interaction with that app and that's actually where your relationship for Uber comes from. So a couple examples of each. Uh, at Seamless, uh, for Seamless, we might have Hospital X uh, in California. Uh, proximity might be two out of five because we're far away, but when we go on site, we're really close to the surgeon all day because we're there for that. Uh, duration, four out of five, because distances are high when we do come on site, uh, we stay for a longer amount of time. Frequency, um, you know, I gave it three out of five. We do quarterly on sites, could be more. And uh, intensity, they've invested time, money, and energy. Our product requires uh, you know, a long onboarding process and setup, configuration, uh, data gathering, all this sort of thing. So there is a significant um, emotional investment as well, especially because the surgeons are generally piloting it um, and they kind of have their reputation on it. ROI, uh, results are strong, but the baseline data wasn't provided. So we know there's data and we know there's value, but we haven't publicly recognized that across their healthcare system. So according to that, the ABF indicates they're at risk of churn, but it'll work with us to increase our ROI. And this is stuff I've validated with our customers that actually fit this description. Example of low touch would be Spotify and myself. Um, my phone is on me all the time. I listen to music all day. I listen to music every day. Um, the intensity is quite low. I would say the only reason I gave them a two out of five is because if you form playlists and follow people, you might have some level of emotional investment in the, in the uh, product. Uh, and the ROI, five out of five. SaaS model is perfect for me for that. I don't want to spend $1.50 on a song from iTunes. Uh, it's so 1999. Uh, <laughs> but the ABF indicates I'll continue to renew uh, my Spotify contract, which is absolutely true. So, um, how do you perform this? How often do you perform the analysis? Um, from my experience doing this over the past uh, year and a bit, as well as the other companies that I've helped implement this, it seems like every six months has proven to be a strong cadence, or um, as often as needed. So staff changes, obviously super critical, uh, expansions, new competitors, anything that might jeopardize any of those elements, proximity, duration, frequency, intensity, ROI, those are the things that would trigger, okay, maybe we need to do a reevaluation of this. Uh, some use cases. So you don't have a health scoring system in place and need something easy to implement. By and large, the people that are using this are early stage startups, because uh, those are the folks that I know well in Toronto are really growing startups, really fast growing startup scene with a lot of early stage startups. Um, or you have a health scoring system in place, but it's too complicated to get um, the data and easily understand and target the root causes. Uh, or three, you have a complex health scoring system that works, but uh, you want to use this as a complementary tool to help dive even deeper um, into your customers and better understanding them and predicting their behavior. In terms of adoptability, uh, the ABF is easy to implement, it's easy to understand, it has no cost uh, yet. Uh, no, it's uh, not limited by industry. Uh, it can be used by any SaaS company, and it can, if you, imp if you implemented last year, uh, last year's winner, Boaz's uh, Maturity Index, it can be used in conjunction with that as well. I made sure of that. Uh, <laughs> so just in conclusion, you know, this, my goal, whole goal with this was to simplify a process that I saw as unnecessarily complicated. I think all of us can identify with that. We've all, you know, we have that person that we work with that uses unnecessary acronyms, like ABF, um, you know, unnecessary acronyms or com makes uh, situations more complex than they really need to be. And when you have scarcity of resources in, an, in a startup, in particular, an early stage or a scaling startup, you can't afford to waste time, you can't afford to invest in things that are just drains of time and money. Uh, so that was a, a major goal for me with this. I also wanted just to help startups to grow in a more agile way. Uh, and I wanted to empower customer success teams with high quality data, because that was where I was coming from. And uh, you know, we're in this exciting space of CS where there's so much room to explore, there's so many new innovations coming out, and we're, as we better understand it ourselves, our market, our space, uh, we figure out better, faster, more efficient ways to do things. And I like to think that this is one of them. So thank you so much for your consideration. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Awesome.